Good morning. Hello, everyone in the back. Please stand if you're not already standing and join me for number 1053, How Could Anyone, in the Teal Hymnal. Good morning. Welcome everyone to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where we join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we like to say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Today I'm going to be speaking about uh, the Heterodox Academy conference that I just came back from and uh, I, I, I think that this, this thing at the start of our service where we say either live justly or work for justice is a great example of heterodoxy, right? Because it, uh, instead of just having one thing we can say, we get to say different things at the same time. So, so keep that in mind. But I do want to uh, welcome each and every one of you to this morning's service and embrace, as always, all that you bring with you, all of your unique beliefs and background and lifestyle and experiences and differences, all that helps make you who you are. And this is true of those in the room with us. Uh, including those of you who might be joining us more recently or for the first time, uh, as well as the many of you who are live streaming with us this morning also. So thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, the one big announcement I have this morning is that uh, following this service, about 12.30, we will uh, have our annual meeting, our annual congregational meeting to conduct some of the necessary business of the church. Uh, elect officers, make some bylaw changes, those sort of things, pass a budget, and we need a quorum. So if you're, particularly if you're a, a voting member of the congregation, uh, which means you're a member of the congregation, then please stick around for that so we can have a quorum. And uh, if you're not a voting member, you'd still be welcome to attend and, and see all the uh, nitty gritty behind the scenes of church life. Actually, that's not true. You'd probably enjoy not being here, but, but, uh, but if you are, you're welcome to stay too. So, Yeah, so that's, that's all I've got. So why don't we take a couple of extra seconds this morning to greet one another while we have the time.
thank you and more time to visit uh, with one another following our service. Not as much time as usual because of the meeting coming up, but hope you'll stay around for that. For now, we're going to move forward by lighting our chalice, which is the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. For my opening reflection today, we'll talk about surrender and letting your life speak. The contrasts are striking. No versus yes, control versus surrender, willfulness versus willingness, holding on versus letting go. When we hold on, our hand is clenched. And when we let go, our hand is open, open to possibility open to experience, open to wisdom, open to compassion, open to understanding, open to life. The illusion is that we are in control when we are not. And it takes many lessons and much time to learn this hard truth. The Buddhists speak of the value of detachment. Some misunderstand this stance, thinking that it means not caring. In fact, detachment is an act of compassion, one that realizes that we cannot control the outcome. Open hands and open heart. As Joshua Kaufman observed, surrender is not giving up on life, but giving up on fighting with life. And when you are not fighting with life, you're working with life. Please stand, join me for number 1031, filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. Madeline, Maura, we're now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our thoughts and hearts this morning. We begin as we have been on behalf of the people of Ukraine and that part of the world who are being impacted by the violence and war there, as well as a candle for the people of Israel and the Palestinian people who are suffering from the horrors going on in that part of the world. 
Also want to kindle a candle of care for Joni Nelson, who's dealing with several chronic health problems that really make it difficult for her to get about and leave, leave home. She does appreciate your thoughts and your phone calls if you want to give her a buzz and talk to her. So we'll be keeping her and, and Sue Watering in our, in our thoughts as they both go through this time together. Do want to kindle a candle of celebration on behalf of Dale and Nancy Avery, whose 51st wedding anniversary is today. Yeah, I don't think they're here, are, are they? I don't, I don't see, they're probably celebrating their <laughs> anniversary. But uh, when you see them, be sure and congratulate them. That's, that's wonderful. And uh, Nancy actually uh, also uh, sent a text through Peggy to ask me to thank everybody with a candle for marching in the pride parade and uh, working our booth and helping us to have a real presence there. So, so yes, thanks to all. I told Peggy that, uh, you know, everyone only gets one submission per Sunday. So Peggy said, well, then I'll, well, then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, support that one, that candle. So I said, okay. I said, it's cheating, but in your case, we'll let you get by with it. So. So actually, there were lots of people who wanted to thank you for showing up for, for Pride this year. So uh, thank you all. And we keep one of our candles at least a lit in gratitude. So let's do take a moment of silence on behalf of others that you might be thinking of. And as always, you're welcome to name them aloud if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. And we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world.
Always a treat to hear Todd play. And Todd, can I put you on the spot one more time? I did this first service too, because I was so curious to know more about the instruments. Yeah, sure. Um, what I'm playing right here is the uh, Japanese shakuhachi. It's an end-blown bamboo flute. Um, like all flutes, it's really just a tube with some holes in it. And uh, the sound is produced by blowing a focused airstream against this edge, which hitting that edge splits the airstream and that's what makes it start to vibrate. And the flute is the only instrument that doesn't have a vibrating medium. So it, there's no reed or string or even vocal cords are a, a vibrating medium that then excites the air. And the flute is the only instrument that you're just directly working with the air column itself inside and what makes the sound so and what about my, your second flute my spiel my second flute here is, just, is a uh, much larger um, transverse bamboo flute generally be used to see and um, also yeah both just uh, tube with holes no uh, mechanisms like you'd be used to seeing on a Western classical flute to just allow more uh, chromatic notes. Uh, the open holes do allow a lot of bending of the notes and other kind of expressive things that way. But that's, that's what they are. Thank you for Pretty sharing your holes. knowledge and your art. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, last week was our intergenerational service where Basically, the whole service was like a time for all ages. So I thought today I would change things up, and this is a story for the grown-ups. I'm not gonna make you all come up here and sit on the floor, but kids, you're welcome to stay in your seats and then we'll walk out together when the story's over. Imagine, grown-ups, sitting with a friend in the shade of a big tree, enjoying a chat while you watch children scale a play structure discover one of nature's hidden treasures, or invent a new kind of tag. The sun warms your skin as the smell of your coffee mixes with the scent of pine. Memories of your own childhood adventures bubble to the surface of your mind, bringing a smile to your face. That's what volunteering at Sunday Play Club might feel like. You may have heard the recent buzz about Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Anxious Generation. In it, he proposes that more unsupervised play and childhood independence could be a solution to the phone-based childhood that is robbing our children of opportunities to flourish. Several years ago, with Lenore Skenazy and others, Height formed the Let Grow organization, which defines play club as mixed-age, unstructured free play without adult direction or interference. Three years ago, we decided to use the play club model on Sundays at UUCS. And there are just three rules. Number one, play respectfully. Do not deliberately hurt or physically harm another child. Two, get permission to leave the grounds. And three, listen to the adults who will intervene only when they must. As a play club supervisor, your job is simple. Be on hand for actual emergencies, but otherwise just disappear from the children's awareness. As we explored last week, kids are pretty amazing at playing, and they'll probably negotiate any conflicts that arise to keep the fun happening. It's just 40 minutes of a Sunday, ideally with your best church friend on your schedule. It's a no prep, low commitment way to support the flourishing of children in our community. You can sign up to enjoy a relaxing morning while making a difference in their lives. There's an online registration form that you can click onto through the Sun newsletter that's coming to your inbox, or there's a paper sign up out in the lobby on the RE table. Our first play club is next Sunday, and we go all the way through Labor Day. Please let me know if you have any questions. Oh, and if you're inter not interested in supervising or aren't able to supervise but would still like to support play club, we will gladly accept your donation of treats packaged or homemade, juice boxes, and if you'd prefer to make a monetary donation, you can just write Play Club in the memo, and we'll make sure that your money gets uh, applied to the right, the right program. And now you can join me in singing our children out to Children's Chapel.
I'm going to do it a cappella. Who went through this note? Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. I invite you now into a time of meditation. Adjust your position so that you're comfortable. Put your feet on the floor, close your eyes. Relax with a slow, deep breath in. And then reflect on these words. The essential surrender happens within you. It has nothing to do with anybody outside of you. The basic surrender is a relaxation, a trust. So don't be misguided by the word. Linguistically, surrender means to surrender to somebody. But religiously, surrender simply means trust, relaxing. It is an attitude rather than an act. You live through trust.
Thanks again, Todd. I, during the, our early service, I reminded folks that you know Todd, who's our AV tech, has been doing that job with us. I think we, we estimated somewhere between five and seven years now. But Todd was really introduced to this church for what what he is, and that is an artist and a musician. In fact, he. The first time he played was the, the first service that I gave for this congregation. He was our special uh, special music that that Sunday. And, uh, you know, he's become quite adept at audiovisual work and even now, now works in that field outside of the church. Uh, but fundamentally, he remains a, an artist, and it's always such a pleasure to have him uh, share that with us on Sunday. So Todd, thank you very much for all that you do, but especially for fundamentally who you are. Oh yes, Maura, thank you for, uh, we're putting Maura on our list of backup AV techs now, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, I just got back from the Heterodox Academy Conference in Chicago. When I say I just got back, like, uh, not too many hours ago. Today, actually, I got back, but it was early, early today. And so I wanted to really, you know, sh have a sermon reflecting my, my thoughts on the conference, which is great, but it also meant uh, somehow putting together a sermon between, I don't know when it was, Five o'clock yesterday and and uh, this morning, so I'm kind of tired. The sermon uh, is, uh, I think, kind of a, a bit of a quilt, an unfinished quilt, because I mean it's three and a half day or two and a half days of conferencing, and it was just a, such a rich experience. I cannot possibly capture all of it, so I want to just reflect on some pieces that were really, really important to me, and I think relevant to us as Unitarians, but I also wanted to begin one, one by thank, thanking Stephanie and Shane Groenholz. I got to say this to Stephanie, the first service, I'll, I'll say it to you now. It was Stephanie and Shane who introduced me to the Heterodox Academy uh, just over two years ago when they were having a conference in Denver. And we actually all went together and it was an incredibly enriching experience, uh, particularly a supportive experience. Uh, when you get around hundreds of people who are going through the going through and share the same concerns that that you have uh it 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 makes the world feel a lot better and that was that was uh very similar to what happened uh this week and and uh this year madeline went so uh we didn't get to hang out much at all because uh she's a social butterfly and was all over the place and i was like <laughs> nobody likes me Not true, I, I'm just a little more reserved. <laughs> but I did want to give you another opportunity to say a few uh, words about your, your experience uh, at the Heterodox Academy. Thank you, yeah, it was wonderful. It was very inspiring and it actually fed me in ways um, that I needed and really the reasons why I came to this church uh, was because I was having my own problems as an artist um, and a thinker, I was not able to speak what I needed to say and use the words I needed to say in order to do my work. So I came to Todd, help me, please, and I happened to fall into this position as music director, which has been wonderful. Uh, but being at this conference was very inspiring for me. Uh, it, I, like you said, was surrounded by some really brilliant people, and that word sometimes is overused, and I'm not, I don't think that that is the case here. Just beautifully brilliant minds, and it was incredibly inspiring um, and uh, uplifting in many ways for me. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, th thank you so much for attending. So, uh, I'll explain more about Heterodox Academy in just a minute, but I want to I want to go back to when I when I shortly after I came here in 2011 came to Spokane to be your minister. 
I began sensing for the first time that something had really gone awry in the Unitarian Universalist Association, in, in our religion, if you will. And it was subtle at first and, and mostly manifested as the willingness of some Unitarian Universalist leaders, mostly ministers in particular, uh, to publicly shame other UUs, particularly ministers, their colleagues, uh, for saying things that they disagree with. I don't know if they really disagreed with them or just found them disagreeable. And there's a difference. Later it became apparent to me that white males, particularly white straight males, were being systematically removed from the UUA's platforms, including its podiums, pulpits, and publications. And during collegial gatherings, which I eventually stopped attending, White males, especially older white males, increasingly felt fearful of openly expressing themselves, kind of what you've experienced, as a result of negative reinforcements and other group dynamics. And these dynamics were uh, at first subtle, again, as subtle as they were troubling, but in 2017, so jump ahead a few years, after a person who wasn't hired for a job by the Unitarian Universalist Association blamed her rejection on white supremacy, all pretense ended and the new illiberal, irrational, and intolerant culture and ideology that has overtaken the UUA and its many members and, 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 and many of its members and congregations became obvious. In an effort to understand what was happening and to make others aware of what I perceived was happening, I began researching this same phenomenon in our, as it's going on in our wider culture, which eventually resulted in my 2019 book, The Gadfly Papers, that led to my immediate public and painful cancellation by hundreds of my colleagues and the UUA leadership, all of which proved the point of my book, which was great because now nobody had to read it. <laughs> and I bring this up now only to say that what I experienced and what our, what our congregation endured in the aftermath of the Gadfly Papers and the disruption and division that is similarly occurring now in many of our congregations, both in the US and in Canada, is not exclusive, not anywhere near exclusive to Unitarian Universalism. Certainly not exclusive to this church. It's happened or is happening in much of the world, especially to progressive institutions. And this is no truer anywhere, anywhere than it is in academia, where it began, starting around 1990, although its roots may go even deeper into the 1970s or even earlier in the 1950s when American colleges first became enamored with postmodern philosophy, right? The belief that there's no such thing as objective truth, reason won't get you anywhere, and uh, one truth is just as good as the other as long as it's our truth. I know that part doesn't make sense, but that seems to be the, the irony of postmodernism, which postmod when pointed out to postmodernists say, yeah, crazy, isn't it? That's what makes us postmodern. So it seems reasonable to believe this is where the problem must also be most dealt with in order to stop the hemorrhaging that is bleeding into the whole of society as graduates continue to enter the workforce and society to influence and even run many of our most liberal institutions and organizations. Right? If, if, if graduates have been exposed to this ideology and accepted it and been moving into the world since the 1990s, they've obviously been around long enough to move into some 
serious leadership positions. And this has led to, as William Galston, a senior fellow of the Brookings Institute, said in a 2022 New York Times article, that they are present in every progressive organization, or there is present in every progressive organization, a small but very vocal fringe that views every problem as a sin. A small but very vocal fringe that, blew, that views every problem as a sin. And the word sin is appropriate to describe the dynamics of what many now consider a new secular religion. And great authors like uh, John McWhorter and, and Andrew Doyle have written books about this. And McWhorter says, I'm not saying it's like a religion, I'm saying it is a religion. And, and Doyle has named it the New Puritanism. It, and it's secular and it's religionist, religion-like in that it is authoritarian, punitive, persecutory, and extremely dogmatic. And this is where the heterodox academy and heterodoxy comes in. Because this widespread phenomenon began in academia decades ago. Academia is also the oldest and most, has also has the oldest and most advanced responses to what's going on. Like we're newbies. What do we do? I know I'll write a book. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Including organizations like Heterodox Academy, also known as HXA, so you'll probably hear me say that sometimes. So heterodoxy translates as different opinions, hetero, different, doxy, opinions. In contrast to orthodoxy, which refers to one right or really literally one straight opinion. Straight opinion. So if you've ever had anybody say, you better get your head on straight. That's a cliche for becoming orthodox. And its website, or as its website explains, Heterodox Academy was founded in 2015 by social psychologist and best-selling author Jonathan Haidt, sociologist Chris Martin, and Georgetown law professor Nicholas Rosencrantz in response to a lack of ideological diversity on college campuses and how it's negatively impacting the quality of research within their disciplines. And that's, that's a polite way of saying we can no longer trust what's coming out of the academy because it is polluted by a bias that lacks openness to other ideas, other truths, other research, or inconvenient research. It also says, our commitment to heterodoxy within the academy is a response to the rise of orthodoxy within scholarly culture that leads people to fear shame, ostracism, or any other form of social or professional retaliation for questioning or challenging a commonly held idea. HXA further envisions an academy eager this is its vision, eager to welcome professors, students, and speakers who approach problems and questions from different points of views, explicitly valuing the role such diversity plays in advancing the pursuit of knowledge, discovery, growth, innovation, and the exposure of falsehoods. So again, during the past three days, I attended <clears throat> the Heterodox Academy's conference in Chicago, along with over 400 other attendees. And I cannot say a negative word about any of the workshops or plenaries that I took advantage of, although some of the content regarding the suffering that college professors, other faculty, and many students are enduring these days is sometimes overwhelming to hear. The very first workshop I attended, for example, was about the foundation for individual rights and expression, known, mo known to most as FIRE, 
founded by attorney Greg Lukianoff, who is a co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind with Jonathan Haidt. The presentation was entitled, Understanding Faculty Rights and How FIRE's Legal Defense Fund Can Help. How's that for a title? Understanding Faculty Rights and How FIRE's Legal Defense Fund Can Help. Now the possibility of a professor getting into trouble simply for saying something that somebody finds unorthodox, disagreeable, has become so pervasive that such a fund has come into existence. Along with a 24-hour hotline for those who might find themselves in trouble. The fund doesn't pay professors to sue a university. It can help them, you know, find lawyers who will if that's what they want, but really to pay for lawyers to help them prevent a situation from going to court by reminding school administrators of their of their rights, of their professors' rights and others' rights of faculty and students, particularly regarding freedom of speech. The reality I learned is that the law is on the side of professors, even though administrators often have to be reminded of this fact, or in truth are so frightened themselves of the consequences that they try to skirt the legal reality. <clears throat> so as far back as 1957, for example, in Sweezy versus New Hampshire, the Supreme Court ruled that jailing an academic because he refused to answer questions about some of his lectures was a violation of due process. Uh, they, 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 they ruled it was a violation of due process, that is, thus establishing for the first time the notion of what has become commonly referred to as academic freedom. So the, the idea of academic freedom has been with us since 1957. Chief Justice Earl Warren stated, the essentiality of freedom in the community of American universities is almost self-evident. No one should underestimate the vital role in a democracy that is played by those who guide and train our youth. To impose any straitjacket upon the intellectual leaders in our colleges and universities would imperil the future of our nation. And it has. In 1967, New York State had a law prohibiting state employees from being part of any organization seeking to overthrow the government, which was interpreted to include belonging to the Communist Party. This led to the Keishian versus Board of Regents, a suit against the, the uh, State University of New York, which required employees to sign an oath stating that they were not communist. The Supreme Court ruled against New York State, once again, firmly guaranteeing this principle of academic freedom. In 1972, in Healy versus James, the Supreme Court ruled against Central Connecticut State College for refusing to recognize an on-campus chapter of the Students for a Democratic Society as unconstitutional, determining that the First Amendment applies to all public institutions. So all public universities must adhere to the First Amendment Freedom of Rights Clause. <clears throat> So how is it then that after all of these rulings by the highest court in the US, it has become so common for freedom of speech rights to be violated on college campuses that it has become necessary to create a legal defense fund for, professor, for professors and others who are simply speaking their minds? At HXA, whether during workshops or informational conversations, I heard several painful stories 
of college professors and others whose freedom of speech rights have been violated or who have been publicly canceled by online, online mob justice or are under tremendous pressure just to keep their mouths shut and to even publicly profess ideas that they disagree with, like DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion statements they have to endorse just to get hired. You may have heard that in recent weeks, MIT, followed by Harvard, just eliminated these requirements. So let's hope this is a sign of a turning tide. In one workshop entitled Encroachment on Open Inquiry, experts from three different fields, social work, psychiatry, and anthropology, talked about ways that college professors are forced to ascribe to theories and ideologies that are unproven, unsound, and contrary to what the facts and research actually indicate is true. For instance, until 2022, the Council of Social Work, of Social Work Educations, the Council of Social Work Educations, EPAS, Educational Policy and Accreditation Standards, didn't include the terms equality, inclusion, anti-racism, anti-racist, or white supremacy at all. Right? Until just a couple years ago. Since 2022, they are dispersed dominantly and instructively throughout the document, 26, 22, 2013, and two times respectively. In many cases, the directives surrounding these words are extremely burdensome, if not impossible, for professors to adhere and administrators to adhere to. Right? They, they, they have to prove that their students understand and are devoted to the new dogma. How do you do that? The psychiatrist who presented this information was similarly frustrated regarding bold efforts to distort and suppress the truth and uncertainties about treating young people diagnosed or misdiagnosed with gender dysphoria. He spoke of distinguished professor Alan Josephson, for example, who was demoted, essentially fired, in 2017, he was demoted to junior faculty member after serving 15 years as chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Psychology at the University of Louisville. Now, you might say Louisville, but because I lived there for 25 years, I know it's Louisville. During a 2017 panel discussion, right, he was invited to share his expertise. He said, the notion that gender identity should trump reproductive organs, external genitalia, is counter to medical science, and that transgender ideology neglects the child's need for developing, coping, and problem-solving skills necessary to meet developmental challenges. And whether or not these comments were in alignment with what others are saying about this serious issue, a person with Josephson's expertise should be allowed to express his opinions on the matter without repercussions. More recently, biologist Carol Hooven left Harvard after publicly talking about the reality of gender. You might have heard her name mentioned, not quite truthfully in the congressional hearings uh, with some Harvard, Harvard uh, or I should say academic uh, leaders, I think December 5th. Uh, said, said she, was, she was forced out, which uh, well, well, I'll get to that. Uh, she, she disputes that to some extent. 
But when she talked about the reality of gender as a biologist, she was immediately attacked on social media by a representative of Harvard's DEI office, ad hominem attacks, right? You know the kind, calling her transphobic. Even though Hooven had said, understanding the facts about biology doesn't prevent us from treating people with respect. We can respect their gender identities and use their preferred pronouns. Eventually, Hooven felt it necessary, however, to resign, explaining, while the stated aims of DEI may have been laudable, in practice, DEI culture allows the recasting of certain ideas as dangerous and harmful, which squashes viewpoint diversity and the open, vigorous debate that should be at the heart of a thriving institution of higher education. So while I was not forced to resign, she has in quotes, Harvard's culture of intolerance, particularly toward my scientific views on the nature of sex, led me to feel that my only choice was to leave. I also heard about another distinguished endocrinologist at the McGill University School of Medicine, who was removed from teaching on the topic of disorders of sexual development due, the, due to the complaints of two students who declared he used outdated and stereotyped conceptions. Imagine the fear that instills that if you say something in your class, a couple of students can go complain and end your career. The presenter told similar stories one after another of experts in their fields being punished, vilified, drowned out by campus protesters for not adhering to the new party line, even when supplying ample scientific evidence and research for their opinions. I heard former state, uh, or, or excuse me, former San Jose State anthropology professor Elizabeth Weiss, who was forced into early retirement after posing a picture of herself posing with a skull and handling, handling it without gloves in her office. You know, magazine type cover, anthropologist, right? After the post stirred outrage from some in the Native American community, she was locked out of the school's collection of skeletal remains. Upon which she filed a lawsuit claiming the university retaliated against her. However, she lost her battle and she largely lost it because uh, in the courts, Native Americans are not usually considered parties to lawsuits. So the, the court says it has no standing in, su in such, a, such a matter. So she really lost her battle to regain access to the collection because the courts wouldn't really intervene on her behalf. Instead, she and the university reached a settlement to have her voluntarily submit her resignation, which uh, is basically early retirement. She has a new book just out about the ordeal entitled On the Warpath. So. <laughs> She does not mind being politically incorrect, I guarantee you that, at this point. Uh, in addition to many other examples, I routinely ran into other HXA attendees who told me about their own such tales, like another anthropo anthropologist in Canada who feared for her job after being called to the administrative office for mentioning the reality of male and female gender. Part of what is necessary to understand the remains that we discover, that anthropologists discover. We even heard from keynote speaker Hakim Olisei, who was publicly crucified after refuting claims about James Webb whom some claim was homophobic, 
and part of a plot to root gays out of government positions. There was an effort to prevent NASA's latest telescope from being named after him for these spurious reasons, which prompted Lucier to research the matter and to discover, during which he discovered the claims were completely false, just made up essentially online by some bogus inferences, if you will. Which is why NASA never addressed the matter when asked why they didn't put out a public statement. They said, because it's not true. We're only going to address things that are true. And kept the name Webb, James Webb as planned. James Webb being, the, I think, the first director of, of the agency. So regardless of the truth, he was canceled because he refuted what others insisted is still true, even though it isn't. And I could go on, but I think I've said enough to make the point that life on our college campuses these days is oppressive. It's oppressive for professors, faculty, and students who are afraid to do the one thing that they are all supposed to do, be able to think and to speak and to argue out loud. Fortunately, there was also lots of good news about a shift that seems to be taking place. I particularly enjoyed a session entitled, What Universities Owe the Liberal Project? Yay! Because that's what we are. We're liberal religion. An expression of the liberal project from the Enlightenment. And it included three presenters, all of whom agreed that universities must return to and make liberalism's commitment to free inquiry and debate the core ideal of their mission and culture. And I was particularly inspired by Emily Chamley Wright, president of the Institute for Humane Studies. An organization, according to their website, rooted in classical liberal tradition and promotes a freer, more humane, and open society by connecting and supporting talented graduate students, scholars, and other intellectuals who are driving progress in the critical conversations shaping the 21st century. And I was extremely interested in attending this workshop because I am a liberal, a liberal minister, and one who also believes that the solution to the extreme divisions, to the intolerance, and to the lack of progress going on in the world today requires a recommitment to the liberal project. We need another renaissance to rediscover its ideals. Professor Chamley Wright, who was kind enough to share her manuscript with me, did not let me down. I wish that I had time to read it to you in its entirety, but a few excerpts will have to do with her permission. With the understanding that these are big problems, I want to suggest that an even bigger problem looms. The fate of our generally free, constitutionally constrained, liberal democratic order is hanging in the balance. It's not just the universities. It's a much bigger picture. Enlightenment era liberalism advanced imperfectly and inconsistently a radical idea that individuals by default deserve respect. No matter who they are, where they're from, what they believe, whether I know it or agree with it or not, I can just look at a person and know, because I'm a liberal, that by default they deserve respect. This default respect translated again, haltingly and inconsistently, into liberal democratic freedom. As it evolved, liberalism also became a mindset, a cultural ethos, that privileged openness, curiosity, ingenuity, and intellectual humility. 
This metaphor, the university as the front line in a war, has become so commonplace that we don't even think to scrutinize it. My concern, however, is not merely that warfare is a particularly bad metaphor. It's that the metaphor does, it is the metaphor that does the real damage. The campus culture war framing turns the peaceful exchange of ideas into combat. Intellectual rivals are no longer colleagues who seek to understand or persuade. They are enemies we seek to crush. Friends who issue challenge in one direction are not thought partners. They're traitors. We must expel them from the ranks of learned society. Worse still, the culture war framing has led to both sides arming up, willing to use illiberal means to seize power and exercise control. Instead of an ideological war, we ought to be finding fellow liberals, whatever their political stripe, who still believe in these core principles and working with them to identify solutions to hard challenges facing the liberal order, both on campus and in the broader world. We're facing a lot of complex challenges, she says, backsliding of democratic norms, rising polarization and declining social trust, climate change, health care, housing, design and governance issues in tech and innovation, the list is long. And ideally, solutions to these challenges will be liberal solutions that preserve liberty and foster human flourishing. But that can't happen if liberal ideas and concerns are not at the table. Reigniting scholarly interest in the liberal project is not about insisting upon a list of preordained conclusions. It's about reminding ourselves and our fellow liberals that basic liberal principles, the inherent dignity of every person, individual liberty, equality before the law, intellectual openness, limits to government authority, require continued exploration and fresh application if we are to sustain and fortify a robust, inclusive, liberal, democratic society. Like I say, I wish I could read you the whole thing. It's just, I was like, man. Beautifully, beautifully said, heartwarming. So th this was the last lecture I heard, and it was, for me, the most important message of the week. The good news is, again, that many presenters express their beliefs that the tide is finally turning, thanks in part to brave souls who are willing to speak up and take a beating if necessary. I already mentioned MIT and Harvard's recent elimination of the DEI hiring requirements. That's a great sign. Also, during the past uh, two years, HXA has nearly doubled its membership and now has 50 H H HXA communities, additionally, on campuses across the U.S. and Canada, which means there are campuses that are uh, permitting heterodoxy to be a part of their campus, campus ecosystems. And this change will reflect, I think, HXA's or Heterodox Academy's commitment to open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. As its slogan says, great minds don't always think alike. And I also now have hope that liberal values, those I've been preaching about for years, those that are supposed to be central to our Unitarian religion have a real chance of becoming humanity's core values again so that we might live peacefully together and advance together as one human family across the globe. So I walked away from this uh, academy conference feeling positive and great and charged and supported, and I hope you do too.
Please stand, join me for our last hymn, number 1018, Come and Go With Me in the Teal Hymnal. Come and go with me to that land, come and go with me to that land, come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. Come and go with me to that land, come and go with me to that land, come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. There'll be free. Closing benediction today, here are the words of James Arthur Ray. Control is never achieved when sought after directly. It is the surprising outcome of letting go. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum and shalom.
just somewhere in the in the in the beginning of your remarks, somewhere just find a place to do that. Get out there. And the other thing was the, the minutes weren't posted in the back, so the only access that members had to the minutes of the last meeting was on the website through a link in the sun, so that anybody.